Welcome back, everyone. We're continuing our study of Luciano Berio's Sequenza per flauto solo. And here is a shot of my ancient part. This is the music I bought when I first started working on the piece. And I have to say that it's the music I continue to use when I perform the piece. I love all the old pieces of scotch tape and all the markings and all the ideas, the fingerings, and the fact that so many people have helped me with it, and that the composer was with me when I was working on it. And, and I love this original version. I started working on it probably shortly after it was written, 1958, so it would have been in the early 60s that I started to play it. And so probably in Luciano Berio's mind there was still stuff that he was thinking about about how to organize the piece. And so for that reason, there are some things that he told me I could do, slightly changing this uh, published version. M recently, he, Universal, Universal, came out with this edition, which I always feel like <laughs> it's kind of like Johann Sebastian Bach getting really, really fed up with flute players playing melodies that he would write with the most terrible ornaments. And so while Handel would write a, a just a simple melody and expect his players to ornament beautifully, or Vivaldi also, Johann Sebastian Bach said, oh, forget this, I am going to write out these ornaments for these people so that I hear them in the way I envision them. And so I think the same thing happened with Luciano Berio, that he, he probably got a little tired of people playing his sequenza like a lot of people play syrinx, like they feel like it should go, you know? So it's a little hard to play this grace note so fast, so let's just play a little slower. So what if the tempos don't quite match? And So he probably heard enough performances of that kind that he decided to make this new edition, which is very beautiful and very concise and very clear, and you have to be counting the exact note values in order to play and use this edition to play from. So I think it's a wonderful study guide because it kind of takes you into <laughs> how he imagined each phrase at the moment that the final proof came to him because this was a composer who was really so inventive and, and thinking of other possible ways. Many composers are like that, of course, but he being Italian had this kind of theatrical bent and things would change, and he would say, well, why not try it that way? So I love this to look at, but when I perform the piece, except for the one time that I played it by memory when we did at the 92nd Street Y in New York, we did all the sequenzas, and we all had to play by memory. And boy, was that a scared bunch of musicians backstage. <laughs> but, <laughs> but we all went out there and we did it. And it's wonderful, actually. I, if I, I'm maybe too old now, but if I were younger, I would start playing it by memory all the time because it's actually can you can even walk around and play it. Um, so here we are. Let's just take a look at this original version. One of the reasons I like it so much is that in total um, sync with the time in which it was written, in which Beckett was writing these plays that had a lot of kind of improvisational improvisational qualities to them, although he was very specific about exactly how he wanted the improvisational qualities to be done by marking them carefully. Berio did the same thing. He gives us a beat, which is a very fast metronome marking, and he also said, well, it could be a little slower. The basic metronome beat can be just a little bit less than 70, whatever, more like 60. So, between those beats, the performer has the leeway to place the notes visually. That's so beautiful about it. So visually, that you can go ba 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 That has to come right before the beat, and ba 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 exactly after the beat, and then a little wait ba 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 ba. Then he gives you a reflection. Da da da. But I'll play a little bit of it later, but just that you hear that beat in your head and it goes to the center of the earth, and that you, the clown, you're playing, you're making these quixotic gestures, 
um, quirky. It's a very quirky piece because it was the first one. It was written for Gazzaloni. It was marvelous. Uh, how can I say? He was willing to experiment. He played a lot of new music and he was willing to try anything. So visually, it's so beautiful. And if you think of this. <laughs> Right? Okay, so now, also, the piece has motives that are very important. This is super important. This is going to be heard very many times through the whole piece, including through the most feverish, machine-like places. Um, so, there it is again. Starts the, so let's say the first page is the first kind of entrance of the character, the flute, the sequence of notes that you're going to be playing. Remember him when we were talking about Samuel Beckett, he stops to reflect a moment when he wrote, writes these little fermata there? They are for you to stop and reflect. Like, just stop moving. Bum, bum, there you are. It can last. Then suddenly the rhythm starts again, and that's when, so there's a similar moment in Syrinx, when this then has to apply to what the rhythm was before, right? When he writes a line over it, it's these notes are connected. So the phrase continues even though that beat is going behind. This is a short note with a space. Grace notes as fast as possible. So I remember before many performances of this piece, just the week before, just doing the grace notes, just practicing those grace notes. Over and over again, so they would go, da -da -da -da. they would just be there really fast. Same with this. Very clown-like, very comedia. Little feather in your hat. Doff your cap. All right, we're getting to the, a huge storm outside, so this is a perfect time to talk about the stormy middle section. Can you hear me? Okay, so now he has us going way up. Right? And then another gesture. And then the motive. Then very quixotic. Then he starts getting us into something that is going to bode kind of ill for us because it's kind of like we're going to get caught in a machine. Do you ever, I don't know if you've ever watched, it's, I think it's called Modern Times with Charlie Chaplin. Charlie Chaplin. He's working in a bakery or, you know, he's working in a machine thing and he has to make his, he has to make this machine and the machine, the assembly line keeps going faster and faster and he's trying to keep up with it. Charlie Chaplin is another great clown. Don't can't even call him a clown, but a clown figure who evokes great deep feelings inside us. So here comes the music. It's starting to say that it's going to do something strange. It pauses for a minute on this high note. Then it starts getting very kind of anxious in a way. Although I have to say that when I was working on this with Luciano Berio, he said. I played a low C, ba da dee, ba. And he said, I played a da 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 da. And he said, no, not beautiful. Not a beautiful note. This is about sound. It's not about beautiful flute notes. It's about sound. So when you play this, not operatic, just full of action. And then when you play these little trills, you have these quixotic things on the top, fast grace notes. Now here we go, caught in a machine, with just the biggest flutter time you can do. And here, here's the motive in the middle of it. And then caught back in that machine, and the fingers moving faster and faster as the, the trills go slower, softer and softer. The fingers get louder and louder, so you have to keep slapping your flute, unfortunately, until the finger clicks disappear slowly to the six Ps. Then we emerge back here, and then the famous multiphonics, which absolutely 
amazed me because he was the first one to try that. We were a one-note instrument until Luciano Berio, and then the huge amount of geniuses who have emerged afterwards. Robert Dick was one of the first ones who was really using it as an expressive device, and now so many people are using our multiphonics. And then here, Dolce. I love the way he put Dolce in there. Because, again, he's Italian, and the, and the poetry can't help but enter this piece. It's not dry. It's got a lot of heart in it. But again, in the commedia style, which is not, it's, there's a slight ironic quality to all of it. I think that's important to remember, I, the irony. Dolce, dolce, dolce. And then this last part, the coda, is so fantastical. It's like the feather in the cap, or the little something that a character, a little scarf that a character would shake. So beautiful. So magical mystery tour. Like all the grace notes very fast. And then gradually disappearing. And then here, as I guess it was T.S. Eliot who said that the world will end not with a bang but a whimper. So here we have the bang, bang, and then just this you can play that last note. So that's how I think about it anyway. And of course it's your piece, each one of you who plays it. But the richer you can make the stew, the better it's going to be for your own interpretation as an artist. The more you can know about the man, the composer, the styles that influenced him, the time in which he wrote the piece, and how people were experimenting with musical notation at the time. All of it together will make you a good interpreter of this, one of our great masterpieces, the Sequenza by Luciano Pieri.